Hey, welcome back everybody to the Benes podcast and today's episode is number 31 with Ryan Panone. I believe Ryan will be just the first one of the next big guests that are upcoming uh, in the next couple of weeks, um, months, 31 through 40 will be big, I believe. So stay tuned. Um, today we talked to Ryan about his career, about the path he took, about the decisions he made and, and uh, what thought process he went through about making the decisions. Uh, the opportunities he got, it was very interesting. It's a very um, in-depth story about his life, about how how things just got put together along the way. And uh, when when he had to make a decision, how he went about making the decision. Uh, also touched a little bit about player development and a little bit about his personal life as well. Um, talking about uh, something that maybe not everyone is aware of uh, on the other side of the game. And as well as the ATOs, of course. So if you enjoyed, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, also, please subscribe to all the audio platforms, Apple, Spotify, and all the other ones that you prefer. Um, very happy that you're here. And I hope to see you soon again and listen to some more episodes. Thank you. Bye. Action. Ryan, welcome to my little world here in Bali at this time. I appreciate it, coach. <laughs> it's uh i'm i'm in a long long uh long waited for vacation in bali on bali uh in bali whatever you want to call it and uh, i refused to to go for the cocktails at the infinity pool today because i had you on today uh i i, I stayed away from all that so you have to deliver ryan i i think it would have been far more interesting if you went with the cocktails <laughs> that that works both ways though it can't be just me you know so like it gotta be it's gotta be a pre uh predetermined decision here by both of us oh yeah i you know what i i quit drinking pretty much when i got the g league job three years ago wow uh yeah i uh we <clears throat> i'm i was so scared of of like just doing something stupid right it's like you get this amazing opportunity to be an NBA G League head coach. And there's not much wiggle room, I, I think, within my background and my career to have a chance to make it. And so I tried to eliminate some things that could potentially derail my career. And, uh, you know, the reality is, I, to be fair, I don't, it's not like I like sipping wine anyways. You know, I, I, I never really enjoyed the taste of alcohol. I just like the way it made me feel. I, you know, obviously you go to a social setting, you drink. But yeah, I, I quit drinking a few years ago because I was afraid, okay, I, I didn't want to risk potentially doing something stupid that could cost my career. You know, it's like I, for most of my coaching career, I'd tell players all the time, you got to do everything within possible reason to make it to the point you want to go and make sacrifices and I, I, so i couldn't join you even if i wanted to <laughs> there's mocktails out there too <laughs> <laughs> that's it's even you. worse that's, <laughs> that's, that's a sin that's a sin no it's uh it's smart actually because like you said there's not much wiggle room and and it's also a potentiality of saying something that you really wouldn't say really when you're not intoxicated or whatever um that's it's a social lubricant in, in some regards you know you can like socialize easier sometimes it takes off some guards and we are here also to take our guards down in that regard as well so and we don't need alcohol for that um but uh, we met through our common friend simon cody uh, i remember that that uh, afternoon coffee very vividly in in hano and uh, i think that's that's the first time that i i met you we got to sit together and and uh, our good friend simon is uh is is still still with us everywhere where we go we're always on in touch we're always we're always talking about you or uh, you talking about me with him and so um what do you what was we're going to talk about a lot of things today but what do you remember from that meeting when we were together you know what i i think one of the first things i remember because obviously i was currently an assistant coach in second division germany is <clears throat> your path you know, it's like Simon explaining to me your path to how to get where you got to become a, an NBA international scout and uh, how you had the opportunity to be in Seska and work for Coach Messina 
And so for me, one of the very first things I remember is as Simon and I were walking to the meeting, he was going through what your path was to get where you were. And obviously, as somebody that was starting my European career at a similar stage that you were starting at, I was like, man, this guy's made it. You know, he, he made it to the NBA, he made it to the EuroLeague from Cuxhaven. And uh, <laughs> so I, I thought that was really interesting. You know, and it's like, and then it was like, man, the other thing is because uh, obviously I was 30, 30 years old and, um, you know, it's like really getting to know Simon because that, that was kind of early is how many people Simon Cody knows, <laughs> you know, like that, that guy knows a ton of people and the amount of people he was able to introduce me to in that year. And it's like, you know, we'd go places and it's like everyone knew Simon and everyone loves him. And so I was thinking as we we're walking, I was like, man, this guy knows everyone. This guy was in second division Germany and was able to make it to the EuroLeague and to the NBA. Uh, those were the big takeaways that I remember. Yeah, Simon Simon was the first NBA uh, affiliated person I've met when I was still in Cuxhaven. So it was it was really a long chain of events there that got put us, put us together. But yeah, it's it's a, it's a very Simon is a common denominator for a lot of people, I believe. Oh yeah. So today. Today we'll talk about a little bit about your background and and how you got into coaching. Uh, then we'll talk get to the bulk of the conversation, which was important for me also to talk about all the the, the coaching stations or the coaching path in itself and and the decision making behind your uh, career building um, per se. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about a little of those nuances on a, throughout your path and then some player development and some personal questions that I would like to ask you before we go into the ATOs. Are you ready to shoot? I am ready. All right, <laughs> let's, let's go. So, so I ask everyone that the same thing, you know, and if you, uh, are you a listener? Are you a listener of my podcast? Do you, Naturally. Do, you... <laughs> <laughs> do you have <laughs> European coaches on it? Uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've been able to listen uh, to quite a few of the podcasts. I haven't listened to all of them, uh, but I've been able to listen to quite a few. So the most the most frequent question I ask every coach is, how did basketball find you? Uh, so like where where was the uh, like the first intersection for you and basketball uh, in itself? And, and how, how did you go on to coach? You know, I'd, I'd say really the, the very first intersection between me and basketball started with my stepfather. Um, my father kind of played every sport. Uh, he was New York state champion, yo-yo or nationally ranked ping pong player, you know, minor league professional baseball player was professional pool and uh, bowler, but not good enough to make any money. And so basically every sport he played, I attempted to play. And my father was a very talented individual. And as he would try to teach, he would just yell. <laughs> and he couldn't really teach and so basically every sport he played I just didn't play and so kind of one of the main sports he didn't really play was basketball and my stepfather did and um, my stepfather introduced uh, me to basketball I probably would say maybe fifth sixth grade and that's kind of when I started playing and that was kind of the introductory to basketball for me and then as I played throughout high school um, finished playing my senior year and, uh, I had some small college opportunities, but my high school coach who was like a father to me. It was my two best friends. Father offered me an overpaying job at 18 years old. Um, and, uh, it was, you know, at the time it was like a ton of money to me, $35,000. And, I. Yeah. Uh, Oh, my, it was more money kind of than what my mom had, had made. And I couldn't say no. And I had this big envision with uh, me and one of my best friends are twins. One went to college and, and played and went to school and me and the other one went to work uh, for him full time at 18 years old with the envision of becoming business, you know, business people. And uh, I became his assistant coach right away. So I quit playing. I became his assistant coach at 18 and I uh, did that for two years. And during those two years, I really figured out I wanted to coach full time. And um, 
So one day I just, uh, you know, I decided I was like, all right, I'm going to go to college. I hadn't really gone to college. I was 20 years old and be a manager because I wanted to be a college coach. And uh, there was a coach in our area named David Thorpe who was training NBA players full time throughout the season, was preparing guys for the draft and working with NBA vets in the off season. So I kind of called him 17 times uh, to get him to return my phone call. And that's kind of how I got my start really in coaching. Persistency. I mean, like it, it, it's, it sounds like uh, it's you, what you told me off air about, about China, which we're going to talk about, but also with, with the phone calls, it sounds like you're very persistent and, and goal oriented and you knew right away what you wanted and you just chase after it. Chase after it recklessly. You know, yeah. I mean, I, once I, once I knew at 20, okay, I, I mean, it was, I had a great job. I was overpaid for what I was doing. Um, since then, the, the, the other brother has like sold his company for 40 million. So who's smart near him? And uh, yeah, it's, so uh, the, my two best friends, one, one is a, uh, is a super successful lawyer. And then the other one, you know, uh, sold his business, the one that I was working with for, you know, like 40 million. So, uh, you know, I chased after coaching with reckless abandon. You know, I was like, all right, one day I was like, all right, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to be a manager. That year I actually became the head coach of the high school I was an assistant at and started working for David Thorpe. And so that was at 20. And then I'd just been chasing it around the world uh, for no money for a long time. That's a good. It's a good starting point as well with David Thorpe to be to be his uh, right hand and and basically follow him and and absorb all the information that that's possible at that age and with that early starting point for a coach that's that's also very valuable because a lot of a lot of coaches usually start a little bit later. I think I mean like former players obviously they start later coaching, but um, it's it's a very hard entry point for every coach to find a good mentor and to find somebody that's going to put him on the right path. And I think David Thorpe is probably the, the really exact person that you wanted to work under. You know what? I, I got really lucky um, to not only work under him, but the way that he was able to teach me, you know, so like he, he would really not just, utilize me okay rebound screen do this he would teach me how to coach yeah and he would consistently coach me up from the way that i dressed to the way that i looked to even my attitude i mean i you know i i was a high school coach became a head high school coach and uh kind of built up the high school program and so high school coaches within our area weren't doing much for their high school players And of course I was doing a bunch of player development stuff with them. We were playing all the time in the summer, but I went through and I built out an email database of every division one, division two, division three, NAI school, junior college in the country, head coach, assistant coaches. And I started creating highlight tapes for all of our players, uh, basically three, four times a year and sending out to the level that they could play it. You know, my entire goal was not to win high school games, but was to send guys to college. Mm -hmm. And as a result, a bunch of players started uh, transferring in for me. And uh, we had a lot of success. And at like 22, I was arrogant. Um, I was more so arrogant in the work ethic, the people around me. You know, I just couldn't understand why they didn't work harder for their players. And then, of course, because all these players were transferred in for me, I was recruiting them, which wasn't necessarily true. We were just sending guys to college, so other players wanted to come in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be able to have a mentor one day, you know, he took me out to lunch and he sat me down and, and he's like, why are you so arrogant? Why are you being a jerk? Just because you outwork people, just because you're having success doesn't give you the right to act like that. Doesn't give you the right to be that type of person. And, uh, you know, so I, I was very fortunate that at a young age, I had guys like him, Stan Jones, who's the associate head coach at, at Florida State, Kevin Sutton, who at the time was running Montbert Academy and was one of the top high school coaches in the country. He's now at Kansas State, 
I was lucky at a young age to not only have coaches invest in me and to help me grow, but to tell me the truth, you know, to say, Hey, you you know what, you got to dress better. You got to change this. You've got to do this. And, um, you know, I think that's oftentimes missed for young coaches is being able to have somebody it's, it's like players, right? Players need somebody to tell them the truth. And so do young coaches that are trying to really develop and grow. And, and I had that in, in those guys. That's like uh, mentorship is so important in every aspect of life, but especially in coaching, when you said like, you have to have the right person being able to communicate the right things to you and being able to communicate them in the right way uh, that you understand them as well. You know, that you also like can personify, personify what he's really trying to get across. And that's, um, that's very lucky <laughs> just to keep, keep it, keep it as simple as possible and having the right people around, because I've seen also um, in different cultures in Europe, there's different ways of, of how coaches get brought up, but I also see of how uh, a lot of coaches, head coaches don't allow their assistant coaches or other um, coaches in the staff to do anything. They want to control the whole process and then raises the question of how do you develop the assistant coach into a head coach besides that, just him being smart enough to absorb and to, learning not by doing but learning by seeing observing and making notes and then when it's your turn then you kind of like getting thrown into cold water it, besides the fact you know like except the exception would be where he brings you along right and he gives you like some, some little tools along the way to 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 learn as you go and then it's it corrects you on the side and gives you kind of like pushes you in the right direction i think it's it's a much more useful way of growing growing coaches instead of uh, keeping them down and then giving them once when it's their turn then all of a sudden they have to be able to perform on on stage you know like and it's not fair i think to a lot of coaches i got really lucky i mean i i still remember it's one of the coolest days you know i'm 20 years old i've been around for less than a month and coach thorpe was was teaching previously something about selling everything with your eyes face and shoulder right so it's like when you make a move like really sell use the craft and he was teaching a jab step to donis haslam and i went over to him i was like coach i was like should should we be selling the jab step with our eyes face and shoulder and uh went back he's like he's like guys ryan had a great point we got to make sure we're selling you know our jab step with our eyes face and shoulder like i've been there a month you know like like And I'm sitting there and like Udonis is like looking at me and he's like, Ryan had a great point. And what, what he did, right. Obviously he knew that like, you know, he's David Thorpe is brilliant and his attention to detail is sick. And he knew that, but what he was doing was empowering me to the players. And, you know, that helped, that helped create a lot of leverage for me with those guys, the way that he phrased it, the way that he empowered me and also what he did, which, which was really smart, especially if you hire good people, right? It's, it's a way to create buy-in, you know, it's like, obviously David Thorpe owns everything in terms of it's the gym, it's his company, it's his players. They're going there to see him, but By giving me that small ownership, you're like, I got to work my butt off for this guy. Like, you know, and, and I did. And he kept coaching me up. He kept empowering me along the way. And as I got older, I'd be like, all right, Ryan, you, you run the workout today. I'm going to sit and watch. And he would, he likes to sit and watch the players, like from a different point of view. But then also after the workout, He'd be like, hey, you're talking too much. I, I was super fortunate from 20 until I got the G League job that he just coached me up all the time, you know, for 15, 16 years. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, he gave you street cred, basically. It was amazing. You know, it was <laughs> like to be 20 years old and, you know, you're in the gym with like Kevin Martin, Udonis has them, and, you know, you, your, your eyes are big and you're learning. You know, it's like everything you thought, of course, at 20 years old, you, you think you actually know something about basketball. And then you're watching David Torp teach, and you're like, I know nothing about anything. <laughs> you know, and he gives you this credit. And, and it was, you know, I, I was super fortunate the way he treated me and a lot of the coaches that I was able to work for. 
they were the same exact way. Like they really empowered me as an assistant, which allowed me to learn and to grow in exactly what you said. I mean, to, to be able to experiment, to lead a drill, to fail, you know, and, and to then have a chance to improve and get better. So if not basketball, what do you think, like, just to rewind a little bit before we go into the bulk of the conversation, uh, if not basketball, where do you think you would have been right now? Stay at home, husband. <laughs> it's, uh... I, mean, I, I can't, you know, it's like you got some people that are like really smart, you know, like uh, they can just do other things. You know, it's like it's, for me, it was basketball or bust, you know, like other people I always hear the advice of, uh, you know, it's like, make sure you have an option B in case option A doesn't work out. It's like advice given to young coach. And I was like, I think that's terrible advice. <laughs> like, if you got an option B, at some point you're taking it. At some point you're like, mm -mm, this is too hard. I'm 30 years old, married, moving to Germany to be an assistant in second division Germany for 700 bucks a month. You know, it's like <laughs> at some point you're like, mm -mm, no, nah, I, you know, I can go work at McDonald's and make more money. So for me, it, it was always I was going to find a way to make it and at some way, shape or form, or at least be okay with financially never making it. And uh, the only other interest I have is like hanging out with my kids all day. I'd be a stay at home. <laughs> that's, no, I, that's, that's nice. Yeah, hobby. <laughs> yeah exactly. My, my wife is super intelligent. And, uh, you know, she can, she could go be, uh, she works for Liberty University. She has her doctorate. She teaches at the university level still online. And uh, that's that's what I would do because I I wouldn't make it in anything else. <laughs> yeah, I had the same 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 uh, approach with being a player, becoming a player. And I did have my my host family father in uh, in the states told me the same thing. What's your backup plan? What are you what are you gonna do if it's gonna not gonna work out? I'm not. It, it's it's gonna work out. That's that's how it's supposed to work. I'm that's all I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play basketball until and then whenever it finishes, it finishes. But that's how it went. I mean, I became a, a, a basketball player, but then injuries came and then all of a sudden you were in the coaching position and you go, you go from there. So, but there's no, whenever that, that first plan fails, that's when you look for the next plan A. There's not gonna be plan B, just plan A and then plan A point two. <laughs> <You know? All right. laughs> um, so uh, you had you had different coaching um, stations, let's call them, in countries. You, uh, Wallace State Community College, is that right? Was that the first uh, official well, official position? Well, I, I was a high school coach for seven years. Okay. And right. I was an assistant from 18 to 20. Then I was a head coach for five years, which, you know, it's kind of like what you said. It's most people even – managers, GAs, young coaches in Europe, right? Like the first time they really get the coaches older. I mean, I was coaching at 18, you know, and I was the head coach I was working for, like he, he was running a multi-million dollar business. So I got to run a lot of practices. I got to coach like all the summer games that I finished playing and I was coaching the team in the summer at 18 and <laughs> 18 and 19. And, and basically by the time, you know, I finished coaching at 25 as a high school coach, I coached a thousand games, like between summer, spring, fall, actual high school season. And um, from there, I went to junior college and, and worked for a coach named John Meeks, um, which was a great experience. It was a really, it, you know, it's like, each experience kind of helps you for your own different way, right? Like the high school level I was coaching at, it wasn't about winning titles. I was all about trying to get kids to college and that plus junior college and what ended up being in the G league, all of similar formats, right? It's like everyone feels they have to score their way out of where they are to get where they want to be to where the reality is like you need to win. And yeah. so the experience I had as a high school coach, trying to manage a bunch of players that were transferring in to have a chance to go to college, to then go to junior college where no one wants to be in junior college, to then eventually ended up in the G League where nobody wants to be in the G League and everyone's way to get out is scoring. No, it, I mean, it helped me like to have that experience of really managing that even from 20 to 25, you know, like where it really started building. Um, so it, it's, it's just so interesting how every experience kind of 
builds and prepares you for the next. But I went from junior college uh, to China. So yeah, like this, those those are the steps. Like that, China came next, then G League, then Hanau, Germany, then Jerusalem, Slovakia, head coach Jerusalem again, and then G League again. But the the first the transition, the transition as you talked about, uh, talked about it off air a little bit. Transition from community college to uh, China. Please tell everyone how how persistent you were in that uh, situation and what made you pursue that position that hard. You know, so I was coaching junior college. My wife came up uh, for spring break. So when I went to junior college, my wife, she was teaching at the high school I was coaching at. And so the job in junior college paid like 500 bucks a month, uh, no housing, nothing else. You know, I moved up there. My wife stayed to teach and support me. And she came up for spring break and we were watching House Hunters International. And she's like, why don't you look into coaching overseas? I would really like to live abroad. And I had always like dreamed of doing, um, you know, of, of coaching overseas. And I got to go to China the summer before because we, we were working with Yi Zhen Lian for three years. And Yi Zhen Lian uh, was running the, his camp in China. So I went on to Euro Basket and I found every American coach at the time that was coaching overseas that I could find on social media, basically Facebook at the time and shot them a message. I mean, every coach I could, and I know a lot of young coaches are going through this now, uh, pretty much nobody responded. You know, it's like, you should always be, hi, I'm Ryan Pannone, and I was explaining, my wife would like to live overseas. I'm just interested to hear, how do I get this started? You know, because right, everyone at some point in their career is just trying to figure out how to get where they gotta go. And I got really lucky, I, I was sending all these messages, And um, Joe Welton, um, who I don't know if you remember, he had coached in the BBL, was a head coach at Geeson. And uh, uh, he coached in the BBL, coached in England, coached in Switzerland. Um, he's spent over 20 years uh, in Europe, had gotten a job in China. And so I shot him a message and he's like, hey, I just took a job in China. Let me get back to you. Like one of the very few people that responded. So this was like April. And uh, I said, okay, great. Summer goes, didn't hear anything. Calls me like August 3rd. And uh, he's like, hey, I need an assistant coach that's focused on player development. Do you want to come? And I was like, 1,000%. My anniversary was like August 8th. And like, I already had a visa from China from like, from work in East camp. And so I knew how to like fill it out, get it in quick. And I took off left like four days later and went to China. And I, you know, I was really lucky because Joe Welton um, obviously gave me a chance and he, he broke me in and got to go to China and uh, was really good to me and gave me this huge opportunity to get out there and same, he, you know, he coached me up throughout my time there and spoke to me a lot about European basketball, you know, because he had the opportunity to be there. And um, while I was there, I had learned one way they found him, the team in China, was through LinkedIn. So I'd never heard of LinkedIn. I was like, I, you know, I was there, created a LinkedIn account. And I went through, I just tried to add, I went on Eurobasket. And I looked at every coach that was coaching any type of team in Europe. And I just started adding them on LinkedIn. <laughs> just like, <laughs> add, add, add. And then I was looking for every foreign coach that was coaching in China at the time. Same. Start add, 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 add. And came across our friend, Simon Cody. <laughs> and so what I started to do, you know, it's like what I really figured out, right. Is like, like you said, be persistent, message people. Most people are not going to respond. You know, it's just the reality. And that's been the way my whole career. And uh, added Simon, shot him a message. And so there was a pretty good Italian place run by a real Italian guy in Foshan. And so every foreign coach that, that was coming into the city, I would try to find him on LinkedIn, shoot him a message, be like, hey, you know, if you want to get dinner when you're in town, there's a really good Italian spot. I'll pick you up and we'll go. 
shot Simon a message, didn't know him. He responded. Simon and I went, you know, picked him up at the hotel. We went out to eat and started to build that relationship. And uh, that season ended in China. And I was able to make a lot of really good connections and have an unbelievable experience working for Joe Welton. And, and I mean, you know, it's like being a foreigner in China, you, you can really kind of connect with the other foreigners, you know? Yeah. And uh, cause everyone kind of knows what you're going through. And it, it was coaching in China was an amazing experience. I was 27 and uh, living abroad with my wife and my first experience there is like, you know, I know nothing, right? Like I grew up as a typical American where, you know, where Americans are relatively arrogant and ignorant about the rest of the world. And I remember <laughs> when I was going to China, my dad was like, going to China? Why are you going to China? They crap in the ground. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, okay. And I got there. I was like, they do actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was not, he was not wrong. <laughs> it turns people, out, but turns out people in san francisco do too really <laughs> <Not. laughs> but, but i mean so but but here's here's right like the the ignorance and the arrogance uh of us as americans you know it's like my father's like oh they they crap in the ground and uh and i was like yeah okay and i get there i was like oh they do crap in the ground <laughs> like, why don't they use a toilet right and it turns out that's actually the way that you're supposed to use the bathroom, like it aligns your intestines. So yes. <laughs> here we are, you know, like I'm as a typical ignorant, arrogant American. I'm like, our way is better. Use the toilet, you know? And it's like, here, this country is like 2000 years older than us. And, you know, and it turns out the way they do it is better. And that's what one of the big takeaways like I had from China in terms of like self-growth, is typically as Americans, right? Like we look down on China. It's like, oh, China. There are so many great things in their culture and in their country that would make America much better. We'd be a much better country and culture if we adopted it. And what I learned everywhere we win, that applies. Like in every country and culture, there are so many great things that we could take back with us to America and make us a much better country. I think that's, that's a, in a lot of places, if you don't have the open mindset, like you, you're, it doesn't matter what country you're from. Like if you're just really too stuck in your own ways, you're not going to take anything from any culture, but if you're open-minded, you will actually be able to see it. That's, that's not only for American, that's also a Lithuanian and a German. And then it's like it, you travel to experience, to meet people. That's why I'm here in Bali also traveling for the first time for a longer period. And I have a completely different feel and, and, and um, respect for the people in Bali just because of how peaceful and how their approach on life is, you know? And if you are just, if you go to a secure spot, you go travel to, a, uh, to one resort all the time in, in Turkey or whatever, if you like, if you're a tourist in Europe, and you feel like you've seen the country, but actually you didn't see the country just because you were just always stuck in the same resort around the same people and didn't get to meet the culture. So if you are an open-minded person, I think that you you have to travel, you have to meet people, you have to be able to learn, absorb new information, and then apply it at your own home at it, to, what, to whatever extent it fits. You know, It doesn't fit always one-to-one, -one, but you should be able to apply some principles in any culture that you live in from other cultures. Um, oh, I agree totally. I wanted to to move on to a little bit to talk about um, opportunities. All right, so so the the this all the uh, clubs that you coached at or different countries uh, that you coached in. Um, in the beginning, it was more about getting an opportunity, right? Like it was more about like being persistent and chasing opportunities. Uh, and then at some point, I'm sure it became where you also had to decide between. Uh, different, uh, different opportunities, opportunities right so you had to make a decision on what job to take and what job not to take uh, so I was wondering how did you get to 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 a point where you had to make a decision and then base what did you base your next the, the the biggest decisions later on in your career of what job to take and what job not to take who do you rely on and how did you differentiate between good jobs and bad jobs 
Well, I, I think starting out, you know, it's like I didn't have many opportunities. Like I had one opportunity to go to China and I could have gone back to China. And I, I came back after that season. I worked with David Thorpe full time. We had six full time NBA players. And, um, you know, then I went to the G League. That was kind of like the first year I wasn't part of a coaching staff. And I love player development. My background is in player development. That was the first time I wasn't a part of a team. And um, so then I had the opportunity to go to the G League and then Germany. And so some of those kind of first starting out were the only opportunity. Like I could have stayed in the G League or gone to Germany. My wife really wanted to live in Europe. And uh, I thought it was a totally different experience to have after being in the G League as an assistant for one year. Um, my experience wasn't great in the G league. And, uh, so when I had that one opportunity, I've been trying to get to Europe, you know, I, I, I left China and I was like, all right, I'm going to go coach in Europe and crickets, no opportunities. You know, I was like, I, I just ignorantly thought I was like, all right, yeah, I've been in China. All right. I've worked with like 50 NBA players. Somebody's going to hire me in Europe. You know, like I'm going to go to Europe and coach and I had zero opportunities. And I was like, I'll work for free. And, um, you know, I, I kept in touch with Simon while I was in the G League and Simon got the offer and he called me and he's like, hey, I got this job. It didn't pay anything. Do you want to come? And I was like, 100 percent. I want to come. You know, so <laughs> for me, it was like I, I was able to. OK, I could have stayed in the G League or, or gone to Germany. My wife really wanted to live in Europe. My experience in the G League wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I was pretty disappointed by it. I was like, you know what? Let's take this chance. Let's go to Europe and experience something different and live there. And I've got this great story, you know, worst case. And when I went to Germany, you know, it's like, it, it's interesting now, right? Like the typical mentality is for Americans coaching in Europe is we don't understand the European game. And what I didn't understand at the time when I was leaving China, I was like, yeah, for sure. I'm going to be able to get a job in Europe. And of course I knew nothing about European basketball and, and that was kind of the mentality. And, and when I got there and I got to see it, I, I started to see what other people thought and, and see why. And what I began to realize was like, it is a totally different game. We do not understand the game. And so I, I began to get it. So went to Germany for no money and worked for Simon and started to build the relationships there. And I began to make all of my decisions not based off money. So every decision I've made in my career was based off opportunity. And when Simon offered me the job, he's like, hey, it's going to pay nothing, but you know, it's going to be a great experience, sold. I thought it'd be a great experience. I thought I'd learn something different about basketball. I'd be coaching professionally in Europe, even though it was second division. Had a great year, learned a lot, and uh, had the opportunity to go to Jerusalem. And a big part of that was through another Simon Cody connection, Yaron Arbel, and <laughs> who I met in uh, the Albert Schweitzer tournament that year with Simon. And it's interesting how many connections came from that year, right? And, and stemmed all from, from China meeting Simon. And uh, because how I got Slovakia also came from second division Germany in, in some ways. So uh, I, I get the opportunity to meet your own. Um, also, I was working with Omer Caspi and Gal Meckel. And so like your own, Omri, Matan, uh, Omri's agent, uh, David Thorpe, a lot of people were helping push me to Jerusalem. And I was speaking with the GM guy, Harrell, and they did not have an opening. And I was in South Korea at the time. I remember I was, I was running workouts for the LG Sakers. And um, he uh, signed Simone Pianjani got the job. And uh, Guy came back to me. He's like, look, we don't have a position. I'm going to create a position, but we don't have any money. And I told him, I was like, you know, all I need to do is live. Like, just get, you know what the cost of living is. 
I just got to live. If I can survive and live and not go into debt, I'll make it work. And uh, that's been my approach everywhere I've gone. It was never about the money. You know, on, on your resume, it doesn't say how much money you made. And it doesn't list, oh, you made this amount of money. Just list your experience, what you did, what your position was, what that team did. And for me, the value was always betting on myself and chasing opportunity over money. And what I hear all the time is like, mm, I can't afford to do that. You know what? I had to sell a lot of stuff. I mean, like I, I had to sell gold chains and other stuff to be able to financially make it work. And, you know, that, that was the reality. And I was going to find a way, you know, and then I had to do side camps, side hustles. You know, I, I created a website, basketballhq.com. And, it, you know, that when I was taking all these jobs for no money, that website helped support me to where I could financially make it. And so when I had the opportunity in Jerusalem and Simon was like, oh, Simone Piangiani, man, he died. I love his teams in Siena. They played unbelievable basketball. You know, I, I, I got the opportunity. I didn't know coach. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so interesting how ignorant I was. You know, it's like I got hired and he sent me a message. He's like, welcome to the technical staff. And I was like, what, what, what is the technical staff? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like well, what is that? I don't even know what that meant, you know, because I mean, that's not an American phrase, you know, and <laughs> I, 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 like I never spoke to him. He just sent me a text. I was like, OK, great. You know, and then uh, the club had sent me to Miami to work out Amari. We signed Amari. And so I went there for like two weeks to work him out to make sure he was in shape. And, you know, I got to Jerusalem and got the opportunity to work for coach and, and it kind of gets to the David Thorpe thing. Like Simon Cody gave me a lot of experience and let me run a lot of drills and corrected me and helped me learn and grow. And then I got to work for a uh, coach, you know, who won six straight Italian league titles, got in two Euro league final fours. And, you know, I remember like the first three days I didn't talk. And I, cause I was like, all right, here's this super successful European coach. I'm some stupid American and I was just kind of working the guys out before practice, after practice. I didn't speak in the coaches meeting. I didn't speak at practice. Cause I mean, you know, that's kind of like the American mindset, right? Like just shut up. And coach didn't know me and he didn't really hire me. And all he told guy, he's like, look, if you've got 10 good people that will work hard, hire all 10. That, like that was the parameters he told the GM. So after like the third day, we're in the coaches meeting. And I don't know, have you ever spent time with Coach Pian Johnny? No, never. Uh, he's, he's hilarious. So we're sitting in the in the coaches meeting. I'm not talking. And uh, yeah, he goes, Ryan, you stupid fucking American. Are you going to sit there and dream about cheeseburgers all day? Or do you want to earn a paycheck today? I've let you be on vacation for three days, but now you must contribute to basketball. <laughs> <laughs> as yeah, straightforward like, as it gets <laughs> yeah but and, and he's doing it and obviously the way he was doing it was right to, to to be funny to be engaging to get me to open up and you know so okay I started giving my opinion but then in practice I said nothing I was like I'm not I'm not getting fired you know I was like every day <laughs> every even now every day my goal is like to not get fired so <laughs> I'm in practice not saying anything I'm coming from second division Germany, you know what I mean? Like, which the jump from there to Jerusalem, as we know, it's gigantic. And he comes up behind me and he just starts whispering in my ear, use your voice, you stupid fucking American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to get me to talk and practice. And <laughs> the way he treated me was unbelievable. And yeah, I, I talk to him, you know, all the time now. I talk to him, you know, what he did for me in Jerusalem really set up my career. And, mm. and the way he treated me really set up my career. I mean, he gave me a huge opportunity, you know, and to be there and to have that experience and the way that he treated me and the way that he helped me grow and the way that he gave me confidence and, uh, in, in what I was doing. 
And, you know, so it, it was that opportunity. Most people would be like, mm, I can't afford to take that. And it's like, you can't afford not to take it. You know, mm. like, I don't care what I have to do, you know, sell a kidney. Like I was going to find a way. And it was rough. Like it was a tough year financially. And it was amazing. You know, mm. and I, I finished the year and I was an assistant coach for Hapol Jerusalem in the Euro Cup. We won the Israeli League title, went to the Euro Cup Final Four. You know, like the experience on my resume and to do a great job working for coach opened up a lot of doors, you know, and it's like that was going to be the mentality that I was I was going to chase. And, you know, you said, how do I make the decision for the next job? You know, I I got an opportunity to be a head coach in Slovakia. And that came from two reasons. One, uh, two things that helped Chris Insminger who I met in second division Germany, working for Simon Cody, uh, turned the job down. And I really got to know him because like every coach that came in to play us in Hanau, uh, what I noticed is like they were having to organize a post-game team meal. And you know, as like a head coach, like that's a lot of work. So I found our on a, one of our sponsors and I just started, I, I thought it was a great way for me to connect with every coach in the league. I started calling the head coaches before they came in and played. I said, hey, look, I, I know finding a post-game meal is really difficult. Here is our menu from our sponsor. You can give me each player's individual order because, you know, in Europe, like everyone just orders the same thing. And uh, I was 60 pounds happier at the time, and food makes my day. And uh, like, I like to have my individual order. So I told every coach in, in Pro I was like, hey, send me the individual order for every player. I will order it and I will go. So the game would finish. I would go to the sponsor. I would pick it up in the car. I'd drive it back to the gym and have it on the bus of each player's individual order. And so that's how I met Chris Ensbinger. And <laughs> so Chris was offered the job and he turned it down and he had had recommended me. And then my agent, Philip Parun, who I met at the EuroLeague Final Four in Berlin when I was coaching in Hanau, is obviously he's, he's Czech and had a lot of the Slovakia players also pushed me there. So I had this opportunity to be a head coach in Slovakia. But also during that time, I was offered an assistant spot in Ludwigsburg for John Patrick. And this is the type of person Simone Pianjani is. We were in the playoffs. We were down 0-2 in a best of five in the first round. John Patrick knew, obviously knew of Simone Pianjani, appreciated the way his teams played. Simone called him when we were down 0-2 in an elimination game to recommend me for the job and spent an hour on the phone with them. Wow. Who would do that? Yeah. We're, and like when we lost that second game, you know, our fans attacked our bus after. You know, right. like, I'm sure. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like the pressure was on. Coach spent one hour on the phone trying to help me get a job. Wow. Yeah, put, That's put, unbelievable. Putting people people above basketball right there. So I got offered the Ludwigsburg job. Like Simone got out, he got off the phone. He's like, I just spent one hour on the phone. For sure you got offered the job. <laughs> Coach Patrick called me, offered me the job. And uh, my wife was super excited. You know, Ludwigsburg lived there. And I was also offered the Slovakia head coaching job. And uh, you asked me like how I chose. I, I got a chance to speak with Simon about it. And, and I spoke openly with Coach Patrick about it. And, you know, like they both kind of told me the same thing. You know, like Coach Patrick's like, Ryan, look, to, to be a head coach in Europe, very difficult. To be a head coach as an American in Europe, very difficult. To be a head coach as an American in Europe in a team that you can win in, not easy to find. And if you feel you can win there, it's a great opportunity for you. And... Provica had had a history of winning. Um, they were in FIBA Europe Cup before. They had a phenomenal coach. So the, the coach left and I was offered the job and I went to Provica. And 
was a great club, great city, had a history of kind of paying late, which I was okay with paying the players late. And once again, it gets into what, how you make these decisions. So I made that decision to get the job. Okay. I could be a head coach. I could win. That'd be great for my resume. I had the opportunity to go back to Jerusalem. I could have gone to Ludwigsburg and I took the job and we had a great year. And at one point, you know, in the end, I was owed five months salary, but pretty much for most of the season, I was owed uh, two, three, four months salary. And what I was always doing is any time that they could pay me, but the player's payment was late, I told them, I was like, pay the players first, pay me second. And I knew the money was late. What would most coaches have done? Left. They owe me money. We were winning. Doesn't say on my resume how much I made. Doesn't say on my resume how much they owe me. All it says is head coaching experience. And we were winning. And we went 25 and 11. And, you know, after that season ended, um, I was planning on returning, even though they owed me five months salary because we, we had some of our good imports back. The club was great. It, even though they owed me money, they treated me great. The fans were great. The city was awesome. I loved it. It was like Slovakia is underrated as a place to live. <laughs> and like the fans we had in Provica were, were amazing. And, you, you know, there's, there's two important things that really happened during that year, I think, for me and my career, and, and also the Jerusalem job. And it's for a lot of young coaches, right? It's like, when we're young, we want everything so fast. Like, I want to be in the NBA now. I want to be here now. And one of my mentors, Stan Jones, who's at Florida State, used to tell me all the time, like, hey, you, you got to slow down. Like, just work hard, keep your head down, learn. So a lot of times early in my career, it was like, well, why is this guy here and I'm not? Why is this guy here and I'm not? And a light bulb went off for me when I got the Jerusalem job from second division Germany. And it was on Sport Tando. And I was like, it, a light bulb went off of how many coaches were better than me, worked just as hard as me for as long or longer than me, couldn't get this job. And they're saying, why him and not me? Mm -hmm. Why does he get this opportunity? And I didn't deserve it. Like I, I wasn't the most qualified. I wasn't the best coach. You know, I got really lucky through Omer Caspi, Gal Meckel, Guy Harrell, Yaron Arbel, Matan Seminoff. Like all of these people that pushed me, I got really lucky and got the job. And when I got the head coaching job in Slovakia, right, we're talking about Slovakia. There are really good coaches in that league. There are really good coaches in the league. And, and typically what I do before I take the job, before I take any job, I watch the team play. And I try to ask myself, am I a better coach than this person? Like, can I do a better job? And I watch Pravica play, and their coach was awesome. And I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, re, he was so good and uh he he was excellent like he was such a good technical coach and i watched him play and i was like i don't know if i should take this job like this guy's a really good coach like i don't think i'm gonna do a better job than him and he won the title there and uh but the fans didn't love his personality and, uh, you know, so I went there and took the job, was owed five months salary, but I engaged the fans all the time. Like I would do, you know, I'd buy them beers and, you know, set it up to where it's like, we'd have like a fan night where the fans, you know, cause the fans in Europe, like really want to grill you with questions. And like, I let them, why did you take Ryan Martin out here? Why didn't you foul here? And like, I'd let him grill me and answer honest. And I'd be like, yeah, that was a coaching mistake. I should have fouled there. You're right. I'd be like, well, this is why I didn't do it. And, uh, you know, so it, it was an unbelievable experience to be in Slovakia. I could have left. I was owed five months salary. We were winning. I was planning on going back. And I was offered to go back to Hapol, Jerusalem under Oded Katesh. 
and I was at summer league. And at first I said, no, I was like, now I'm, you know, I'm going to stay as a head coach. We had one really good year. I'm returning a lot of imports. I think we can be really good. I was owed five months salary. And I was like, you know what, whatever, I can make it roll another year. I'll find a way. And um, once again, oh, did, didn't know him. He wasn't the one hiring me, very similar to Simone. And the one thing about Oded is his style of play was very different from my beliefs in the way that I played as a head coach and from all the head coaches that I worked for. You know, Simone was very big, four out, stretch bigs, pick and pops. In Slovakia, I combined what I love about European basketball and what I love about the NBA. And that year, we would have been second in the NBA in three-point attempts behind the Rockets if you prorated it per 48 minutes. And we, we were flying. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I coach, his whole style of play and philosophy was, like, very different from mine and my beliefs. And he was also really successful any lot and in these smaller budget clubs and obviously was a phenomenal player. And so the GM was recruiting. I didn't even talk with those dead and he was telling me about the job and I decided to take it. And one of the big reasons why was because he thought so different than me, like his view and his philosophy was a hundred percent different than mine. And I thought that would really help me grow as a coach and it would convict some of my beliefs of saying, hey, you know what, I believe this and I feel this is the best way for me. And it would change a lot of my beliefs and help me learn and grow. And so I remember we were at Summer League and I was taking the job and I was talking, you know, with him. I was like, what are we looking for? And he's like, yeah, we don't need stretch bigs. And I'm like, my stretch four was like, I was playing with stretch four, stretch fives. We were letting it rain from three. You know, coaches tell me, and I was like, no, we need stretch bigs. He's like, no, 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 it's not important. All we need is like guys that can make decisions and pass out of short rolls. And I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. You know, like this is going to be great. <laughs> and took the job. And the, the basis on taking the job was because coach thought very different from me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, go ahead. No, I, I, like you have the decision making process, like obviously money was not in the first place early on and you you from the, the i wrote down it seems like the, the experience itself was richer going forward than their paycheck would have been or 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 was or could have been you know so i think that you went for the rich experience instead of the rich paycheck and uh, that paid off in the long run when you had also the decision making between choosing between jobs and then you chose in a different way where you kind of preferred a different style, different way of thinking and a different approach that helped you grow as a coach going forward. And you, you, you were hoping or, and you will, you knew obviously that a different way of thinking can help you also learn and, and grow as a coach. So those are the things I took from your, from your um, uh, storytelling about different, different jobs that you had in your, in your uh, career thus far. I was super fortunate. You know, I think one thing I've always done is chase opportunity and chase knowledge. It was never about the money. Am yeah. I going to become a better coach? Is this going to provide a better opportunity? And that's what I've done every, every step of the way. Chase opportunity and, and, and chase knowledge. That's, that's a really good um, um, full stop on that. <laughs> um, the, the, the experiences you had throughout this, this um, uh, timeline, let's call it, as a assistant coach, uh, I would like to know where you felt like you had the biggest, um, not necessarily challenges at first, like the first question was like more about uh, that you saw more of um, how you, I don't know how to explain in the, in, the, in, the, in the proper way where you feel like an assistant coach can, uh, you know, has a certain kind of pressure to deal with uh, from from both sides from from the player side and then from the from the coach's side was there is there certain situations you can remember that you dealt with that were a little bit obscure or a little bit uh, without mentioning names without mentioning a certain uh, clubs that were at because you know it's it's between you and 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 those people there that it happened but did you have a situation where you felt like you were between 
two parties stuck and you didn't know what to do and how did you uh, re uh, resolve it? I, I would say no. You, you know, I've been really fortunate that it's like each club I've worked in has has been very good. And even like the the head coaches I've worked for have been really good. You know, so I, I can't say I've, I've been put in that position. Um, and a big part of that is probably the head coaches that I've worked for. And, mm. you know, the GMs of the club. It's like I, I remember one time in Jerusalem, we, we lost four games in a row and like the papers were calling for Simone's head and our GM came in one day, guy Rell, and like, they then started calling for his head for not firing him. <laughs> <Jim came, laughs> like, like guys, you know, what, what do we need? Let me know what you need. How can I help? What do we need to, to win a game? You know, it's like, and Simone never put the pressure on us. And, you know, it's like, the way that he handled it, the way that our GM handled it was unbelievable in a, in a high pressure situation. And it was just like that when we were down 0-2 in the playoffs, like the owner was at the game. And I remember the owner was talking to Simone after and I was like, Oh, <laughs> like they're very <laughs> good. And I, and I was like, coach, how was it? And he's like, yeah, he's just asking, can he, you know, is there anything he can do to help us? What do we need? You know, so like I, I've been fortunate to work for really good people. And uh, I could say I've never like been put in this awkward position uh, of that. And I contribute that to the people I worked for. You know, I was really good people. So but um, going forward throughout those uh, uh, those jobs that you had and moving on to uh, U.S. coaching versus European coaching. And like you, you were one of the uh, American coaches that I found uh, were was very mostly intrigued about the European aspect of coaching and very interested in the different approaches that you also, like you said, you base your decision making for the next job on on different styles, different uh, thought processes. Um, is there something that that in Europe you feel like is mostly unique uh, that that from your from your side of view? Um, stands out the most in in europe uh, any brand of basketball style of basketball that you prefer and that you love to see yeah i mean i so first off i i try to implement these things i think the the way that they are that spacing and movement and offense is taught in europe is at such a high level right now I, I think in america you'll hear the terminology of like spacing is offense and offense is spacing And it's like in Europe, it's like offense equals, you know, pace plus space, you know, plus movement, plus timing, plus reading. Plus, you know, it's a little bit more complicated formula than offense is space and space is offense. And, you know, I heard Coach Trinchetti once say, like, spacing is, is a living organism, right? <laughs> and it's like it's – it's kind of gone from being a static to a dynamic movement and that it has to constantly space and re-space and adjust and readjust based off the ball. And so, you know, it's like what I love about Europe is the ability to teach and get the players to execute that to where five players understand it's a form of selfishness and unselfish, right? Mm -hmm. Guys that are, are improperly spaced and don't move with the reading and the timing and the pace on their cuts are essentially selfish players. And like, for me, I, I think like it, in more of American basketball, spacing is static. Yes. You know, and it's like everyone talks about spacing. And everyone talks about ball movement, but our player movement and the ability to space and re-space based off the ball and the positioning of the ball and understanding, you know, that one foot this direction can totally change, you know, the value of your spacing and the quality of shot you can create. And so for me, I like... When it's I see difference. stuff like that, I'm in love. 
Yeah. There's a difference. There's a difference between living in San Diego and Tijuana. <laughs> That's yeah, what... exactly. <laughs> uh, shout out to Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, and it's interesting. I, how I fell in love with European basketball is through that is through coach Trinchetti. Yeah. You know, I like, I, I don't even know if he knows this. So when I was in Hanau, you know, I, I was, I saw a clinic of his and I was like, Oh, that was great. You know, a lot of coaches do clinics and then you watch your team play and they do nothing that they talked about. So I was like, all right, <laughs> let me go on Synergy through my old G League <laughs> account because we didn't have Synergy in how now, you know, and, and I started watching his team play. And I was like, wow. And so I started cutting up his plays and I started emailing those out and sending them out and putting them on Twitter. And then that kind of grew into like a huge following. So really how I fell in love in a big way with European basketball was watching his teams play in Bomberg. Yeah, and, uh, I I can see that. I mean, that's that's easy to do. <laughs> that's not a yeah. that's not a, that's not a not a big surprise. I mean, a lot of people I think that that grow to understand European basketball will grow to love Andre Trinkieri's uh, offensive spacing. I mean, that's that's a that's a natural given. Um, let's touch a little bit on player development um, before we go. One uh, small thing about a personal uh, life, but. Uh, player development is a lot of times to me about relationship building, right? So I know that there is also a, they, they can be, there can be an obstacle in relationships when the player is a little bit more quiet. So I chose to talk about, uh, to you about if the player is a little bit more reserved, a little bit more introverted, how do you get to open up to him and how do you get to trust him while he's not so open to communicating uh, about his weaknesses, maybe insecurities, maybe, you know, there's, there's the vast majority, vast, vast, um, uh, big, big difference uh, um, between what could go wrong and what he thinks and what, what, what his, what his shortcomings are. Uh, so how do you go about approaching the player and how do you go into his mind and, and loosen him up a little bit? So I'd say number one, like my whole philosophy is the more you love the person, the harder you can coach the player. And when you have more of an introverted person, right? Like you have to try to get to know them. And, and at the end of the day, each person you can find their talking points. Like even an introverted person will open up and get excited to talk about something else. And so what I try to do is, is spend time with them before I overcoach them. Like I always make sure I'm super prepared in my workouts. You know, I'm always available for them so they know I'm kind of invested in their career. And then I try to meet with them off the court and not talk about basketball. Mm -hmm. and, I, and during that, you know, it's like, I'll ask them if your life was a movie. Okay. What would the script be? Give me opening, opening scene till the end, you know, and, And I try to like listen to them kind of talk about the different experiences, their family members, things they went through and figure out what are their talking points? What are things that they'll really open up and have a conversation about? Might be music, might be movies, might be video games, might be about their little brother, you know, might be something non-related with basketball. And the whole conversations are not basketball related. And then once I know the talking points, First time I sent, oh, hey, how's your grandma doing? You know, is she doing all right from, you know, she feeling healthier? Oh, hey, how, how's your little brother's game? You know, and, and to begin to get them to open up, to let them know that I'm interested in more than them, than a basketball player. And then from there, once I've done that, I break down everything that they do. Like I have the honest, I watch every possession of every clip And I can tell you every percentage they shoot in what direction, what the footwork is, what hand, what shot, what location. And I generate all the numbers and I have video with it. And at that point, I, I sit down and I go through it with them. And the reality is most players want to be told the truth by people that they know are invested in them and care about them. Mm. And it's about their career. If they feel I'm doing this for my benefit, they're going to shut you out. But once they know you're about them, you care about them, you're asking questions that no one else is asking, you're interested in what's going on in their life and 
what their trigger talking points are, guys will open up and they'll buy into it if they want to be a good player. Now you can always find an introverted player that's not really, doesn't really love the game, you know, and for that's a, a harder point. But if you got guys that are introverted and love the game, you know, you just have to figure out their talking points. Genu showing genuine interest and, and being genuinely interested in the person. Uh, I find that that's when we talk about networking. I, I hate the word. I, I don't like, I don't hate it, but I, I despise the, the underlying context of the word networking, because to me, it's not about networking. It's about building friendships, building relationships, finding genuine interest in another person's life and having open up. And I'm maybe sometimes too open. So that's also, that was my approach with players as well. I'm just very open about my own life. I told them my weaknesses. I tell them my, my struggles, the demons I'm struggling with right now. Like there's, there's, we're, we're humans, you know, and we have all our issues that we're dealing with, whether it's the player, the coach, the assistant coach, and we, you can't, you can't hide, you know, you can't, you can't put on a front for the, for, for the whole time. At some point it's going to eat you up from the inside and then you're going to have to seek help yourself. So um, I think I found it more uh, uh, interesting and also just healing for myself to talk about my own, my own problems with, with the player and just a little bit like an exchange, you know, so you open it up and they appreciate the same thing. They do the yeah, same thing. I think, I think they respect it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, right. Like when you're in the season, you spend more time basically with those people than your own family. Yeah. And it's like when, when you know you're surrounded with people that are honest and vulnerable and can be open, you know, it's like, like you said, that's where you can really connect. And it's like one thing I always try to do as a head coach, as an assistant coach is like, I'll take ownership for my mistakes. Like in film session, the very first clips are my mistakes. Like I drew up a bad play. I, you know what, on the scouting report, we said to do this and he was killing us. You know, it's like, of course we adjusted in the game, but it's like, Hey, we, this was on the scouting report. These are my buckets. You know, this is my fault. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think players appreciate open honesty and when we're vulnerable, you know, exactly what's going on in our personal life and our professional life, we make mistakes too. That's how you build friendships. I mean, that's how you build friendships essentially off the court as well. You're, you're really you're like, you're trying to be approachable person and, 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 you know, like show, show everyone that you're talking to that you actually have, you're not a robot. You actually have certain things that you're dealing with. You're thinking about certain things and that makes the, the person more interesting as well. Um, but before, before we dive into the ATOs and we, 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 we chalk them up and, 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 and uh, I throw them out there for you. I draw them up for you. I wanted to ask, Maybe that's more of a question for your wife. I hope she doesn't mind I ask you that. But I'm also interested uh, because a lot of coaches, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle for family life. It's a struggle for, for wives sometimes if, if, if uh, personal life is not there enough. Um, how how would, does, your, does your wife go about building a social circle in foreign countries? Or how did you go about it when you were in the foreign countries in Germany or uh, abroad, wherever you were throughout your career? What's what are the, the 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 points that she goes for to to create a little bit of more of a social circle and private life for personal life for herself? You know, I, I think one thing that is done really well on the international teams, right, is it's like almost once you get there, there there is like a small base right away, right? Like you, yeah. you have the other foreigners' wives and girlfriends, right? So it's like right away you have that foreign base. Yeah. Uh, then two, I would say the clubs we've been a part of, like the domestic players, wives and girlfriends have been like very outgoing and helpful. And like, so that's been really good for my wife and my family. And then we always try to find a church where, where we are and uh, try to try to attend my, my wife, obviously a little bit more than myself during the, the season. Um, and then as that's going right, you begin to, to meet people from the fans, from the games, from the sponsors and expand out. Now I would say one thing is my wife is very independent. You know, it's like if I got a job in Lithuania tomorrow, like while I'm at practice, she's going to go out and explore by herself. You know, she's not <laughs> like one. It's like, Oh, I need someone to be with me. Like, you know, you can drop her anywhere and she's going to go off and find her own way and do her perfect. own solution. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, she, she, she's pretty outgoing. She's, 
the sacrifices she's made is why I am where I am in my career. You know, uh, I, I was very fortunate. I would not be where I am without my wife, but uh, I'd say one thing I love about international basketball is like, there is kind of that community. Like yeah. when you get there, like the foreign players, the staff, uh, the domestic players, like they all, they do a really good job of coming together on the teams that I've been on and, and make you feel at home. Because I mean, the reality is like when you're moving to a new country, like it could be hard. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I landed in Hanau and went to the grocery store for the first time. Typical American got cinnamon toast crunch naturally my favorite cereal which you could not get in china and we go back to i went back to the apartment it was like nine o'clock at night and uh poured in the bowl and i ate i was like mm, this is stale i was like right, how's this stale a brand new box i went out to a totally separate grocery store bought another box of cinnamon toast crunch but then i was like what the? then simon had to explain it. he's like yeah you know they don't put all the sugar in the preservatives in it. <laughs> But it's like, you know, I've been for it. Like the, the people we've been around have like really taken us in. So it's been awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Like that's, that's one thing that I experienced also. Like just every club in Europe thrives on building a family environment and the, the successful, the, the successful clubs, they have that uh, aura in the club. You feel it and you, you really appreciate it at the end of the, at the end of every season, there's also most of the clubs have these family get together with all the players all the wives all the families and and kids and that makes the the, the journey worthwhile i mean honestly it's, i try to talk with a lot of college coaches about that because it's like right like we we bring these young foreign players over for college and the, the mentality in the u.s right is like these guys fail you know it's like the euros are soft <laughs> yeah, it's like are you crazy like do you know what these guys go through like american players can't go through what these guys go through practicing twice a day five out you know like they a different can't. life these guys aren't different soft. life right the, 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 these guys these dudes ain't soft now they're not used to the length and athleticism of every player on the court and okay they've got to adjust to length and athleticism which we mistake for softness. And uh, the other thing is like, what are these guys going through? Like they've moved away from their family. The food is different. The culture is different. The basketball is different. You know, they're sitting there and your prags would be like, this is stupid. Why does this guy go here? Why didn't he, you know I mean? <laughs> the reality is, you know, their IQ is off the charts and the game is totally different. The spacing is different. The teaching is different. The coaching is different. And the length and athleticism is for sure an adjustment. And then the off the court life is different. And it's like, like one thing I've experienced is I've always, people have always tried to make me feel at home when being overseas. And obviously, you know, I was 27 the first time I went, not 17. Yep. You know, it's like, and, and that makes a big difference, especially to a young 16, 18, 19 year old kid when they're coming over to the States away from their family, away from their food, their comfort, you, you know I mean? It's like, obviously it's something you experience, you know, and it's like. 100%. Like you have, you have to have a, like a, a warm welcome. Uh, and when you step off the plane, you know, the first approach, like for an American player in Europe, for a European player in America, like the first welcome is so important. And just to make the, the guy, the, the, the person, you know, not the player stuff, but the person more, like relax and like everything is going to be all right. And just like every person reacts different to a new environment. Yeah. And it's like the, the environment to fail, right. It's like the, the reality is right. It's like when American rookie goes over there, like every coach knows it's an adjustment playing wise, basketball wise, life wise, adjusting wise. I remember a story like with Kyle Hines when he was a rookie for coach Trinketti, where he like, <laughs> I forgot to put the parking brake up and like crash the car because I like, <laughs> you know, you're not using the park and brake. And uh, but I mean it's an adjustment and you and you an environment is almost created where you know there's going to be an, an early failure in some way, shape, or form, you know, whether it's off the court or whether it's on the court and the environment to to understand failure will happen i think is oftentimes missing you know and like 
I knew like when I landed everywhere I've been, like, it's like, all right, you know, this is the adjustment period and then you get to go. But like, I was helped out with that. So was my wife. <laughs> That's great. Um, are you ready for the, uh, to shoot your quick release ATOs uh, uh, shots? I'm going to draw up for you right here. All the, sure. all the hammers, all the flare screens, all the. You're drawing it up or I'm drawing it up. I'm drawing it up for you. Uh, with with words <laughs> all right all right uh, best basketball twitter follow Ooh, that's a tough question uh i have to give a few uh <laughs> okay i i can't give one i mean all right you know it's like all right three I, three give three three coaching you basketball immersion slapping glass Best non-basketball Twitter follow? Uh, you know I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> when you add it, like, you're talking about, like, work-life balance, I don't watch any other sports. Like, I, all I do hey, is basketball. I got, now I got to I gotta teach you that now. Like, uh, you, there's, there's something to be learned from everywhere. For sure. 1000 percent there is i i'm a big believer and there is something i i did watch the, the documentary with pep guardiola yep on amazon so i and it was amazing and I, i understood nothing what he was talking about but uh it was uh it was amazing so i i am a big believer in what you're saying there is something to be learned from other sports um I just don't watch them. I don't like them. I don't like any of those. All I do is watch basketball, hang out with my family and eat food. I mean, even like when my wife has got a movie on, like, you know, it's like I'm cutting film while the movie is on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> best, best advice, uh, advice, uh, best advice to lose weight. Ooh. Uh, and people talk about it all the time. You know, I, I lost 60 pounds from my time here. People talk about, you cannot eat a bad diet and i essentially lost 60 pounds really without working out you know i did keto and intermittent fasting um but i i think really if you really want to lose weight keto and intermittent fasting like that that's been the best way for me i i agree i haven't i haven't had a, a weight problem but i know the effects of that so i i can i can just um uh, uh, piggyback off that Uh, biggest pet peeve as a coach? Attention to detail. Um, biggest epiphany moment you had as a coach? I think a big part of that was my career because I think a lot of us at some point are struggling for why we're not where we want to be. And I think it was that when I went from Hanau to Jerusalem of like, because I, I mean, it's like a lot of young coaches. We, we want to, we don't understand why we're not there. And, you know, it's like, I was looking at some of the other assistant coaches that they were looking at hiring, you know, like in the top spot and all that stuff. And like, I was looking at their resume and, and I got the job and I was like, looking at mine and I was like, uh, You know, how many people are sitting there like, how did this guy get this job? Why him, not me? And so I, I think it's something the majority of coaches struggle with. And it's something I struggled with. Like, you know, it's like, why is this guy in the NBA? And I'm not, you know, and I had to learn to one, enjoy the success of others. Like you, you can't control when you get your break and when you get your opportunity. And if somebody gets their break and their opportunity before you, be happy for them. Awesome. That's great. And then you just keep chasing knowledge and you keep chasing experience and you be a good person and you relationship build, not network and enjoy the experience where you're at. You know, like each experience I was at really helped grow me as a coach and help prepare me for where I'm at now. You know what? Like I had three more quick ones, but that was the game winner. I'll leave it at that. That was the game winner ATO buzzer beater. Excellent. <laughs> Ryan, I, uh, I appreciate your knowledge. I appreciate your career. Um, because we like, I've, we've met a long time ago and we, I've, I've seen it grow 
um, throughout the years and we've sit in touch and you, you've given uh, my podcast a shout out a couple of times already on, on, on Twitter as well. Please tell everyone how they can find you uh, on Twitter and any other social media. Uh, and um, I really am happy that you came on and, and found e you find this time. Email address, email address is Ryan Pannone, R-Y-A-N-P-A-N-N-O-N-E at gmail.com. Twitter at Ryan Pannone at gmail.com. You know, easy the, to find. If you're the, the one and only. As far as I know. <laughs> All right, Ryan, appreciate you. Um, have, a, have a great Sunday. Have a great um, church church ceremony. Uh, and uh, I haven't been to church. I should, I should, I should go soon, too. I've, I've, I haven't been in a long time. I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the South, but when I left the South, um, church um, left with me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, brother. I um, will... We'll be in touch. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye.